Now, for example, here is the glomerulus, okay, consisting of the capillary loops, okay. So, over here, if we are taking a transverse section of the glomerulus, so this is what we are getting. So, let us first try and understand from the center outwards, what are the structures that we are reading. So, at the level of the center, over here, number one, this structure that we can see, we can see the mesangial cells at the center, okay. And the mesangial cells, they are surrounded by a extracellular matrix called as the mesangial matrix. So, this is the number one structure, this is the number two structure. Just beneath the mesangial matrix, what you are going to see is your endothelium, okay. You will see what is called as an endothelium, okay. So, basically the mesangium is surrounded by multiple capillary loops, okay. So, these are all different capillary loops as everyone can appreciate. These are the capillary loops and the capillary loops, they are lined by the fenestrated endothelium, okay. So, these are the endothelium which are showing some kind of fenestration to the tune of 7200 nanometer is the gap of this uh, uh, endothelial tissue. Now, just beneath, okay, just outside the endothelium. So, outer to the endothelium, outer to the endothelium, what you will see that there is a pinkish lining. Can everyone appreciate over here? There is a pinkish lining over here if you can see. Let me just show you with the help of this black pen. So, can you appreciate this pinkish lining over here? Can everyone appreciate this pinkish lining over here? Just let me show you. So, there is a pinkish structure over here which is lying just outside. This is the capillary and outside there is a pinkish basement membrane. So, lying outside to the endothelium, we have the fourth structure that is called as the basement membrane. And just outside the basement membrane, there is an epithelia. If you can see, this is the basement membrane and outside there is an epithelium. This is the epithelial structure I am talking about. Now, this is in very close contact with the vis uh, basement membrane and this epithelium is called as the visceral epithelium. It is called as the visceral epithelium. Now, outside the visceral epithelium, if you see, you have a clear space that is called as the urinary space. It is called as the urinary space, okay. And basically, if you see, this urinary space is lined by another epithelium that is called as the parietal epithelium. This is called as the parietal epithelium, which is the sixth structure. So, parietal epithelium is also the epithelium which is lining the Bauman's capsule. So, I hope you have understood this very important point. Now, one more important thing I want to speak with regards to the visceral epithelium. If you see, the visceral epithelium has certain processes over here. And these long processes of the visceral epithelium is called as the foot processes. They are called as the foot processes. The visceral epithelium, it is also called as the podocytes. The visceral epithelium is also called as the podocytes. So, let me just tell you very importantly, what is this structure over here that we are seeing? First of all, okay, first of all, this is the endothelium, which is fenestrated. So, there are gaps, 70 to 100 uh, nanometer is the gap. Now, this is the glomerular basement membrane, as we can see, having three layers, okay, lamina densa, lamina rara uh, externa, lamina rara interna over here, okay. Now, what other structures that we can appreciate over here that this is the podocyte, this is the podocyte that is the visceral epithelium and this is the structure, this is the foot process of the podocyte, this is the podocyte foot process that we are looking at. Now, in between the two podocyte, there is a space that is called as the filtration slit or the slit diaphragm. So, you have to understand what are the proteins which are participating in the formation of the slit diaphragm. So, you can see the first important protein over here is the nephrine. So, one nephrine from this left side and one nephrine from the adjacent, uh, you know, podocyte foot process. So, they are coming on top of each other, okay. So, they are coming on top of each other, okay, and they are forming a di dimer. Now, this nephrine in turn is attached to multiple proteins. For example, there are certain cytoplasmic proteins present in the cytoplasm of the foot process. So, these include the podocin along with the CD2 associated protein and the fourth protein over here is the actin filament. So, 2, 3, 4 are present inside the podocyte and they are also participating in maintenance of the slit diaphragm. So, the proteins of the slit diaphragm include the nephrine molecules, podocins, CD2 associated protein and actin filaments. Any mutations in the genes which are encoding these proteins can give rise to hereditary nephritis or they can cause defects in the permeability and they can result in nephrotic syndrome. 
टुडे वी आर गोइंग टू अंडरस्टैंड अबाउट द नॉर्मल किडनी स्ट्रक्चर एंड द फंक्शन ओके सो लेट अस ट्राइंड अंडरस्टैंड दिस टॉपिक इन डिटेल्स ओके सो नॉर्मली द किडनीज इफ यू सी नॉर्मली आवर किडनीज दे यू नो दे कैन प्रोसेस अप्रॉक्सीमेटली सेवनटीन हंड्रेड लीटर्स ऑफ ब्लड ओके एंड दे कैन प्रोसेस दिस मच अमाउंट ऑफ ब्लड पर डे and convert that into 1 liter of highly concentrated fluid that is called as urine so what are the functions of the kidney the kidney excretes the waste products of metabolism it also maintains the acid base balance it regulates the body's concentration of water salt calcium phosphate etc it is also acting as an endocrine organ okay so it is acting as an endocrine organ so what are the substances or what are the hormones secreted by our kidney so very importantly we have the erythropoietin renin certain prostaglandins and in addition to secretion of the hormones they are also uh, secreting the active form of vitamin d okay now when we want to study about the kidney we have to understand that there are four basic morphological components of the kidney so one is the glomerulus then we have the tubules the interstitium and then we have the blood vessels okay so if you look at the glomeruli okay so most glomerular disease if you see they are immunologically mediated okay so they are mediated by immune mechanisms for example antibody uh, uh, antigen antibody complex formation okay now the tubules and the interstitium mostly they are destroyed by some toxic agents or any infectious agents now whatever be uh, be the nature of any kind of of injury whether it is involving the glomerulus the tubules interstitium or the blood vessels the end result is end stage renal disease that is esrd is the end result so let us try to understand what are the clinical features of renal disease so let us try and understand what are the clinical features the number one clinical feature of a renal disease is azotemia it is azotemia so it is basically a biochemical abnormality now very importantly what do i mean by this biochemical abnormality that is that azotemia is basically characterized with the help of clinical reports so whatever biochemistry reports that you see so it is a biochemical abnormality okay so it is characterized by increase in bun that is the blood urea nitrogen and increase in the level of creatinine levels with a decreased level of gfr okay with a decreased gfr now we have to understand one very important thing over here that uh, this renal disease that is there okay this azotemia uh, it can either be pre renal it can be renal or it can be post renal so there can be causes which are lying at the level of the kidney or there are causes which are lying before the kidney or there are causes which are lying post kidney so pre renal causes includes hypoperfusion of the kidneys because of any cause for example severe dehydration vomiting okay so basically these are the pre renal causes then there can be certain renal causes for example there is any kind of a renal parenchymal disease or there are post renal causes for example there is any kind of a renal tumor or there is any cause because of which the urine flow has been obstructed okay so the cause can be pre renal renal or the cause can be post renal so this is the number one that is the azotemia now the second important clinical feature is uremia so whatever we had read that azotemia is actually the biochemical abnormality and whatever clinical signs symptoms result out of azotemia that is called as uremia so you should know what is the difference between uremia and azotemia so uremia is nothing but the clinical sign symptom which is associated with azotemia that is called as uremia so it is a clinical abnormality whereas if you see azotemia is basically a biochemical abnormality okay i hope this point is very clear to you people the third important point of presentation the clinical presentation of a renal disease can be in the form of a nephrotic syndrome or a nephritic syndrome so this is the nephritic syndrome or nephrotic syndrome so we will understand what are the features of each so if we first see the nephritic syndrome so it is as we can see the itic syndrome it is basically an inflammatory glomerular disease so there is an inflammation taking place of the glomerulus 
Now there is also what is called as an acute onset hematuria. There is what is called as acute onset hematuria. That is there is presence of RBCs in the urine. Okay, that is what is called as hematuria. Now hematuria can either be gross or it can be microscopic. So gross hematuria is when you can see the RBCs grossly with your naked eyes. That means you can see the red color urine. And microscopic hematuria is when you can see the RBCs okay only under the microscope okay and you have characteristic dysmorphic rbcs rbcs whose shape is dysmorphic like this for example they are not round by concave so they are dysmorphic they are broken down like this okay also there will be presence of red cell cast in the urine so the nephritic syndrome is characterized by acute onset hematuria which might either be gross or microscopic in nature there is the presence of dysmorphic RBCs and the presence of red cell cast inside the urine. So I hope this point is clear to everyone. Apart from that, there is a decreased GFR. The glomerular filtration rate falls down. And proteinuria, though present, it is mild to moderate in nature. And there is an association with hypertension in case of nephritic syndrome. So what are the examples over here? We have post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis or rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis wherein the GFR falls drastically. So I hope this point is clear to everyone. Now the fourth very important presentation is the nephrotic syndrome which is also because of some kind of glomerular disease. Now this nephrotic syndrome is characterized by heavy proteinuria to the tune of more than 3.5 grams per day. Okay. Also, there is hypoalbuminemia because of excessive amount of loss of proteins, the albumin levels are going to come down and there is a severe edema. Also, there is hyperlipidemia. There is hyperlipidemia as well as there is lipiduria that is loss of lipid in urine and there is hyperlipidemia as well. So these are the characteristic features of nephrotic syndrome. So you should be able to compare and contrast between nephritic syndrome wherein the major uh, manifestation is inflammation associated with hematuria, presence of RBC cast in urine, a fall of GFR. Although proteinuria is present, it is of mild to moderate nature and the patient has hypertension. Whereas nephrotic syndrome is more often characterized by heavy proteinuria, hypoalbuminemia with hyperlipidemia and lipiduria. Now the example of nephrotic syndrome, very classically we can give MCD that is the minimal change disease is one important example of the same. The fifth important uh, clinical feature of uh, uh, kidney disorders, sometimes the patient can have very mild glomerular abnormality. In that case, the patient might present with asymptomatic hematuria or proteinuria. Now the sixth very important uh, cause over here is acute kidney injury or acute renal failure. So this is characterized by a rapid decline in the glomerular filtration rate, dysregulation of fluid as well as acid base or electrolyte balance, retention of metabolic waste products and also oliguria and anuria. So if the flow of urine is less, it is called as oliguria. Oliguria means where the flow of urine is less than 400 ml per day and anuria means where the level is less than 100 ml per day okay so this is the basic point of difference between oliguria and anuria now this acute kidney injury or acute renal failure is occurring due to glomerular interstitial vascular causes or acute tubular necrosis so it can be because of any of these reasons okay then there is a chronic kidney disease which is characterized by chronic renal failure. So it is defined as a decreased GFR persistently for less than 60 ml per minute per 1.73 meter square for at least 3 months due to any cause and persistent and or persistent albuminuria. So the major criteria is persistent fall in the GFR level of less than 60 ml per minute per 1.73 meter square and that should last for at least 3 months due to any cause and or persistent albuminuria might be associated. So the end result of all kinds of chronic renal parenchymal disease is actually chronic kidney disease. So chronic kidney disease is the end result of all chronic renal parenchymal disease like diabetes mellitus, okay, like hypertension. In end stage renal disease, the glomerular filtration rate becomes less than 5% of the normal level. 
the most common cause of chronic kidney disease as i told you there is a chronic renal palatinal disease like diabetes mellitus and hypertension then there can be some defects involving the renal tubule so there can be renal tubular defects which is characterized by polyuria noctururia as well as electrolyte disorders it occurs due to the disease affecting the tubular structures okay and the disease which are affecting the tubular structures they come under the heading of what is called as nephronophthisis okay sometimes there might be urinary tract obstruction as well as the renal tumor so they will present with signs symptoms depending on the anatomical location of that particular obstruction or the tumor then we can have urinary tract uh, urinary tract infection so there might be bacteriuria pyuria in the kidneys there is pyelonephritis okay infection of the kidneys we call it as pyelonephritis and that of the bladder is called as cystitis then we can have nephrolithiasis that is there might be present of renal stones characterized by severe renal colic that is pain and there, as well as there is hematuria okay clear to everyone okay let let us move ahead now now we are want to understand the normal structure of a glomerulus so let us try and understand the normal structure of the glomerulus now for example here is the glomerulus okay consisting of the capillary loops okay so over here if we are taking a transverse section of the glomerulus so this is what we are getting so let us first try and understand from the center outwards what are the structures that we are reading so at the level of the center over here number 1 this structure that you can see we can see the mesangial cells at the center okay and the mesangial cells they are surrounded by a extracellular matrix called as the mesangial matrix so this is the number 1 structure this is the number 2 structure just beneath the mesangial matrix what you are going to see is your endothelium okay you will see what is called as an endothelium okay so basically the mesangium is surrounded by multiple capillary loops okay so these are all different capillary loops as everyone can appreciate these are the capillary loops and the capillary loops they are lined by the fenestrated endothelium okay so these are the endothelium which are showing some kind of fenestration to the tune of 70 to 100 nanometer is the gap of this so uh, endothelial tissue now just beneath okay just outside the endothelium so outer to the endothelium outer to the endothelium what you will see that there is a pinkish lining can everyone appreciate over here there is a pinkish lining over here if you can see let me just show you with the help of this black pen so can you appreciate this pinkish lining over here can everyone appreciate this pinkish lining over here just let me show you so there is a pinkish structure over here which is lying just outside this is the capillary and outside there is a pinkish basement membrane so lying outside to the endothelium we have the fourth structure that is called as the basement membrane and just outside the basement membrane there is an epithelia if you can see this is the basement membrane and outside there is an epithelium this is the epithelial structure i am talking about now this is in very close contact with the vis, uh, basement membrane and this epithelium is called as the visceral epithelium it is called as the visceral epithelium now outside the visceral epithelium if you see you have a clear space that is called as the urinary space it is called as the urinary space okay and basically if you see this urinary space is lined by another epithelium that is called as the parietal epithelium this is called as the parietal epithelium which is the sixth structure so parietal epithelium is also the epithelium which is lining the baumann's capsule so i hope you have understood this very important point now one more important thing i want to speak with regards to the visceral epithelium if you see the visceral epithelium has certain processes over here and these long processes of the visceral epithelium is called as the foot processes they are called as the foot processes the visceral epithelium it is also called as the podocyte the visceral epithelium is also called as the podocyte so is this point very clear to everyone so from inside to the outside the first structure you have the mesangial cells okay this is the mesangial cells over here just surrounding the mesangial cells you have the mesangial matrix just beneath the mesangial matrix you have the capillary loops which is lined by the endothelium 
that is the fenestrated endothelium structure this is the endothelial structure outside that there is a lining of the glomerular basement membrane that is the fourth important structure outside the basement membrane we have an epithelium that is called as the visceral epithelium which is comprising the foot processes and beneath the visceral epithelium just outside the visceral epithelium we have the urinary space which is lined by the last structure that is the parietal epithelium which is lining the bowman's capsule so i hope these structures are absolutely crystal clear to everyone so let us read the basic structure of the glomerulus let us try and understand the basic structure of the glomerulus so a glomerulus is nothing but it is an anastomosing network of capillaries which are lined by fenestrated endothelium which is invested by two layers of epithelial cells so there are two layers of epithelial cells which are actually uh, uh, you know uh, 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 surrounding the glomerular basement membrane so on the one hand we have what is called as as i told you we have the visceral epithelial cells also called as the podocytes okay it forms a part of the capillary wall which is separated from the endothelial cells by the glomerular basement membrane so first structure is the endothelial cell lining that is the glomerular basement membrane and very closely attached to that is the visceral epithelium this is what we read in between the visceral epithelium and the parietal epithelium there is the urinary space yes the other kind of epithelial cell is the parietal epithelium which is situated on the bowman's capsule and it is lining the urinary space so i hope this is very crystal clear now the other name for the visceral epithelial cell it is called as the podocytes okay it is called as the podocytes okay now we will understand about the glomerular capillary membrane so what i am going to now teach in detail is the glomerular capillary membrane so what is this glomerular capillary membrane that i am going to speak about i am going to speak this entire structure from here to here that is the endothelial lining the gbm the epithelial uh, uh, the visceral epithelium along with the slit diaphragm that is in between the foot processes there is a certain space so what is that so this is basically forming what is called as the glomerular filtration barrier and now we are going to understand the concept of glomerular filtration barrier also called as the glomerular capillary membrane so let us try and understand this in this point in detail so what are the structures which are forming this let us try and understand this glomerular capillary membrane also called as the filtering membrane is formed so again i am going from the inner side to the outer side so on the innermost part what you are having you are having the endothelial cells which is lining the capillary lumen and they are fenestrated okay they are having certain holes each of which is between 70 to 100 nanometer number 1 number 2 the second structure that we see is the glomerular basement membrane called as the gbm now this glomerular basement membrane is in turn having three important layers okay so this is the gbm which is having three layers so the central layer is electron dense and it is more thick which is called as the lamina densa which is called as the lamina densa now on the inner aspect of the lamina densa you have an electrolucent structure that is called as the lamina rara interna and on the outer aspect is the lamina rara externa okay so very important this together is called as a gbm so on the inner side of the gbm we will have the endothelium on the outer aspect we will have the epithelium that is the visceral epithelium and what are the components of the glomerular basement membrane so we have a central electron dense lamina densa on the inner aspect it is a lamina rara interna on the outer aspect is the lamina rara externa okay now remember the glomerular basement membrane it is having a building block that is nothing but it is a triple helical molecule which is forming the building block of the glomerular basement membrane so basically which type of collagen is present in the glomerular basement membrane very important mcq the answer will be collagen type 4 and among the collagen type 4 they they are comprising of alpha 1 to alpha 6 type so collagen type 4 can be of alpha 1 to 6 type and all of these types are present in the glomerular basement membrane now this collagen type 4 is basically involved in formation the collagen superstructure very important point they are forming the collagen superstructure okay now the second important thing to this uh, collagen superstructure are attached many glycoproteins and proteoglycans so glycoproteins like laminins and intactin as well as proteoglycans like heparin sulfate and perlecan 
all these glycoproteins and proteoglycans they are attached to the collagen superstructure so the major structure the, is the collagen type 4 that is a superstructure to which the glycoproteins and the proteoglycans are attached so this is the molecular level the glomerular basement membrane is made up of triple helical molecule so we had read the first thing that is the endothelium then we had read the second thing that is the glomerular basement membrane the third very important thing over here is the slit pore diaphragm okay it is the slit pore diaphragm which is forming this membrane now it is the basic function over here of the slit diaphragm it is connecting the foot processes of the podocytes okay so let me just tell you what are the foot processes you will not be able to understand that much clearly now let me just give you this particular reference so over here if you see on the this is the inner aspect this is the inner aspect over here okay this is the inner aspect and over here it is the outer aspect this is the outer aspect okay of the glomerular filtration barrier so what we are looking over here is the glomerular filtration barrier this is what we are looking over here what we are looking over here we are looking at the glomerular filtration barrier this is what we are going to see so from inner to the outer aspect we will go so the first structure that we see on the inner aspect we have what is called as a fenestrated endothelium we have a fenestrated endothelium this part is called as the fenestrated endothelium is it very clear this is the first structure that we appreciate over here that is the fenestrated endothelium this structure okay which is inner to this fenestrated endothelium this is the second important structure as you can see they have a central area that is called as the lamina densa and they have an area inner to it that is the lamina rara interna an area outside to it is called as the lamina rara externa and this part together it is called as what it is called as the glomerular basement membrane and this glomerular basement membrane as we look over here this is the gbm this gbm is basically forming the second important structure okay of the glomerular filtration barrier now the third important structure which is forming a barrier over here that is actually the slit diaphragm which is found between the foot processes of the podocyte so this structure if you can appreciate over here can everyone appreciate this foot process this is the foot process that we can see this is what is it this is the foot process of the visceral epithelium so what is this structure this is the foot process this is the foot process of podocyte foot process of podocyte which is enlightened over here this is the foot process of the podocyte now in between this and this foot process there is a structure in between there is a space in between can everyone appreciate this this space let me just show you with the help of another marker so you will be able to appreciate can you can everyone appreciate this uh, space in between the two foot process so this space in between the two foot process this is called as the slit diaphragm so the foot processes along with the slit diaphragm over here is the third important component of the glomerular filtration barrier is it very clear so the first component over here is the fenestrated endothelium the second component over here is this that is the glomerular basement membrane the third component over here is the foot process along with the slit diaphragm is this point crystal clear to everyone yes is it very clear to everyone okay the glomerular filtration barrier should be crystal clear to everyone okay now let us look at the glomerular filtration process how it takes place what are the factors which are affecting the glomerular filtration so normally the glomerulus they are highly permeable to water and small solutes but they are impermeable to proteins especially the size of which is very much like that of albumin are approximately 70 kilo dalton or larger so they do not allow any proteins the size of which is comparable to that of an albumin or larger size protein so they are completely impermeable whereas a normal glomerulus is highly permeable to water and small solutes so what are the factors which are affecting the permeability of the glomerular uh, you know filtration barrier so it depends number one on the size of the particle so more is the, the size of the particle or larger the particle lesser will be the permeability so large particles more than more than 8 angstroms they are not filtered at all the second important thing over here is the charge of the particle so more cationic is the charge of the particle more will be the permeability cationic meaning more is the positive charge more will be the permeability 
so albumin in uh, normal uh, situations if you see so basically they are anionic in nature okay so they are far less permeable why because i will tell you there is a presence of certain siloproteins which are present in the epithelium and the endothelial cells and also certain acidic glycoproteins present in the uh, the gbm so which is imposing a negative charge so all in all i can say that the glomerular filtration barrier holds a negative charge normally because of the presence of certain siloproteins and acidic glycoproteins so for example any structure which is positively charged or cationic they will have a positive attraction and they will be easily you know permeable throughout the the glomerular filtration barrier but one important thing is that that any kind of substance which is negatively charged for example normally the plasma protein albumin is negatively charged so because of the negative charge of the plasma protein of this albumin they have a repulsion from the glomerular filtration barrier and so they cannot come out they cannot come out okay now in the glomerular disease in glomerular disease the anionic charge is lost from the filtration membranes allowing the negatively charged particles to come in the urine so this is what is happening so whatever anionic charge is present in the filtration membrane that is the acidic glycoprotein and the siloproteins they are lost actually in glomerular disease so what will happen it will allow the negatively charged particles to come that is the albumin will start coming in the urine so the first structure to come in the urine is albumin is the first to appear in the urine because of the smallest size and the molecular weight okay is this point very clear to everyone the third important uh, uh, you know factor okay which is uh, basically uh, the third important factor which is basically involved uh, in affecting the permeability is the podocytes now remember podocytes they have a function to the in the maintenance of the glomerular barrier function so they are regulating the glomerular barrier function how because in between the podocytes you have what is called as the slit diaphragm which is a size selective diffusion barrier so let me just tell you very importantly what is this structure over here that we are seeing first of all okay first of all this is the endothelium which is fenestrated so there are gaps 70 to 100 Uh, nanometer is a gap now this is the glomerular basement membrane as we can see having three layers okay lamina densa lamina rara uh, externa lamina rara interna over here okay now what other structures that we can appreciate over here that this is the podocyte this is the podocyte that is the visceral epithelium and this is this structure this is the foot process of the podocyte this is the podocyte foot process that we are looking at now in between the two podocyte there is a space that is called as the filtration slit or the slit diaphragm so you have to understand what are the proteins which are participating in the formation of this slit diaphragm so you can see the first important protein over here is the nephrin so one nephrin from this left side and one nephrin from the adjacent uh you know podocyte foot process so they are coming on top of each other okay so they are coming on top of each other okay and they are forming a di dimer now this nephrin in turn is attached to multiple proteins for example there are certain cytoplasmic proteins present in the cytoplasm of the foot process so these include the podocin along with the cd2 associated protein and the fourth protein over here is the actin filament so 2 3 4 are present inside the podocyte and they are also participating in maintenance of the slit diaphragm so the proteins of the slit diaphragm include the nephrin molecules podocins cd2 associated protein and actin filaments any mutations in the genes which are encoding these proteins can give rise to hereditary nephritis or they can cause defects in the permeability and they can result in nephrotic syndrome is this point crystal clear to everyone okay so whatever point i have i have told now i am just going to reiterate my point if you look at the nephrin if you look at the nephrin nephrin is nothing but it is a transmembrane protein what is nephrin it is a transmembrane protein okay why we are saying is a transmembrane because they are covering this entire part that is why they are called as the transmembrane protein now nephrin molecule they are extending towards each other from the adjacent foot processes or from the neighboring foot processes and they are dimerizing across the slit diaphragm so across the slit diaphragm if you see two molecules are nephrin they are forming a dimer and they are covering this slit diaphragm okay now within the cytoplasm of the foot processes the nephrin is forming certain molecular connections with the podocin 
okay cd2 associated protein along with the actin cytoskeleton of the visceral epithelial cells okay so these are the foot process of the podocytes or the visceral epithelial cells with which the nephrin is forming some kind of connection okay so with this we have completed in details about the normal structure of the uh, no, we have completed the normal structure uh, uh, of the kidney